I'm going to be continuing uh, in our Rooted series. Um, if you were here last week, you know that Pastor Brandon dealt with the wrath of God. And uh, typically the wrath of God can be something that what we want to do is we want to shy away from it because it's, if we're honest, it's not like one of the more fun subjects to talk about. I don't know if anybody gets up and just is excited about talking about the wrath of God. Um, but because what we want to do is we want people to feel loved. We want people to feel encouraged. We want people to know that, that God's got a plan for them and God's got a purpose for them. And, and that's good. But truth without love is brutality. And love without truth is hypocrisy. And so we have to be careful to not just love, 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 and never tell people the truth. Because in, in, if we're not actually telling people the truth, we can't really say that we love them. And so as disciples of Jesus, what we have to do is we have to figure out how the stuff that's in this Bible, the Word of God, how do we walk that tension between um, what the Word of God says and what we actually do in our lives? How do we communicate the truth of Scripture and at the same time make sure people are loved? And the passage from last week, Pastor Brandon uh, read this statement. It's found in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And now that word all, it's going to be significant. I want you to remember that throughout the entire talk this morning because it's, it's, uh, it's easy to look around and start seeing where there's uh, what... Paul says is godlessness and wickedness all over the place, but that word all includes us. Amen. And so what we have to do is as we look around, it's not difficult to see society. It's not difficult to see you know, how things are, are beginning to, to have the appearance or are in certain places falling apart. There's this moral decay that we see. We live in a society that celebrates some things that even 100 years ago would have been thought um, shocking and, and unthinkable. It would have been rejected as that's not something uh, that's even appropriate, whether you're in the church or outside of the church. It just is what it is. And we even celebrate now in, our, in today's world things in our entertainment that would have been rejected even two generations ago. And if you look at families and the way that uh, communities are going, there's a breakdown in, in the family unit in the household, and there's a breakdown in communities. There's actually a story about a Kansas City police officer who was walking to Jefferson City to go to the governor's uh, office to talk about the corruption and talk about the, the violence that was happening in Kansas City. And it seems like every day we see in the Kansas City area that there's somebody that's been murdered, something that's happened. I, I know that more and more I'm getting uh, alerts on my phone about uh, Amber Alerts, about a child that's disappeared or a child that, that they, they, uh, somebody has abducted. And it can all be overwhelming to look at the state of society and just go, what is going on? But what we can take comfort in this morning is that this is nothing that's new. We're not the first society to deal with such things. There are some things that are new. Technology has advanced throughout the years. But what we can know this morning and the comfort that we can take from the word of God is this. The human heart is still the human heart. And if God and his word were the answer to human heart hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, then he is still the answer to the human heart today. And so in our passage from last week, Paul wrote this in verses 21 and 20 through 23. He said, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. What Paul is doing here is he is making a commentary of the, the Roman world in his day, but also a commentary about humanity throughout all of history. You read in Genesis 3, and you see where there's that initial rejection of God's authority in the life of human beings, and then sin entered the world, and we've been doing the same thing ever since. We've rejected the authority of God. And it's the beginning, this, these verses right here describe the beginning of what I call the downward spiral. Because when you reject 
the truth about God. Humanity as a whole has rejected the truth about God. But when you do that, you begin down a slippery slope. And sometimes we don't understand the full extent of what we've done when we reject the truth about God. And I may use the term this morning in this message, I may use the term we uh, instead of humanity because we're all included. Though if we understand the gospel to be true, that means that every single one of us uh, is, uh, is, is in sin and we need the grace of God. And so we're all included in this. Here is the problem with rejecting the truth of God. We were created to be worshipers. The way humanity was created, the way that they were wired, we were wired to worship something. And whether you choose it uh, intentionally or not, we will worship something. We will, and if we can't find something to worship, if we find, can't find something that we go, yeah, I want to worship that, we will then create something to worship if we have to. It's no mystery that if you look in, in, in history and in anthropology that in just about every civilization throughout human history, there has become some form of religion. There, there is some sort of a God, whether it be the God of the Bible or a God that somebody else created that came into, that, that came into existence, so to speak. Because religion gives us a certain order. Because with every deity, with every god, with every uh, idol, if you will, that we serve, there's a certain number of behaviors, things that we're supposed to do, things that we're not supposed to do. And so we gravitate around something to give us order in our lives. And, and the problem is that some people try to reject God flat out. And then something terrible happens. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says... Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. When there is no God that is governing our actions, when there is no system of morality for us to live by, then anything goes. Anything can be okay. And we as human beings, we have an incredible capacity to reason and think through things. And what can happen is if we don't have something governing our thought processes, we can get to the point that we rationalize just about anything. And that's how Paul uh, continues in our passage this morning because he's written that mankind has rejected God. And he's talked about how mankind has created gods and idols of their own. He used the example of human beings and birds and reptiles. And one, one Jewish author, he actually said this, he, in describing people, he said, people have become worshipers of sticks and stones. Now, in our, in, in our world, we're a little more sophisticated. Like, our idols have become a little bit more um, subtle, if you will. But we still have them. And in our world, we can begin to worship things we can worship people. We have a celebrity culture in our world that we begin to idolize where people are and what they've done. And, and we go, if I could just be like them, then I would be okay. We, we've begun to idolize even ideas and ideologies and possessions. Have you ever wanted something that somebody else had because you thought that it would make fulfillment in your life? That's making a possession an idol. Or we can even do preferences. We can even worship preferences. Well, I'm only going to go those places that agree with what I choose and what I like. And if I don't agree and I don't choose, then I'm going to have nothing to do with it. Not only that, I may not even follow the voice of God to go there because they're not doing what I like. And so Romans 1, it provides a warning as well as a wake-up call for all of us. Because remember, we said in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is being revealed against how much? All. All the godlessness and wickedness of people. Without Christ, we're all included in this. Without Christ, we are all lost. In fact, there can even be Christians who profess Jesus, and yet by our lives, we can be just as godless and just as wicked. And what this message this morning serves as is it serves, it serves not as a grounds to point fingers because we're going to talk about some things in this passage that are very, very, can be even hot button issues for some people. But the point of this message this morning is not for us to point fingers and go, well, they are wrong and I'm okay and they need to get saved. And, and, and this, it, that's not the point this morning. But what it is, is it's a mirror. Remember when we talked in the James series about the word of God being a mirror and what we do is we hold the truth of the word of God up in front of our lives and we go, where does it apply to me? 
So let's jump into these verses this morning. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27. If you're reading ahead of me, you, the, 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 here's the challenge with reading, um, with, with teaching expository like we are. Everybody knows or can know before we get there what we're talking about. So uh, some of you know uh, where we're going, but let's jump into it this morning. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. That's the initial rejection. The initial rejection is that we reject God as God in our lives. And as we saw in Proverbs, we cast off restraint as a result of it and we begin to justify all different th kinds of things in our lives. We continue reading in verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural, sexual, natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. The challenge, the, the difficult thing for us in this passage is that phrase where it says, God gave them over. What do we do with that? And if we have a theology where, where God is just a God of love, we go, what is, what is this peace that says that God essentially gave them over? to? The, why would God put them into a position that they, would be, that they would get to the point where they would reap the consequences of their sin if he loves them? But the full understanding of God in the Bible is that God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath that we talked about last week. And he's also a God who is just. And so Paul writes that man rejected God, and in response, God gave them over to their desires. It's almost as if God says, okay, if that is what you want, here you go. It's as if we're in a boat. Uh, picture this for a moment. It's as if we're on a boat on the edge of a river, and God is standing there with all of the invitation of grace and all of the opportunity to come to him. And it's almost as if we look at God and we say, no, I want to see where this thing goes. And God, because he's not one to force anybody to do anything that they don't want to do, it's almost as if he gives a little shove off the, to get the boat into the current of the river that we call sin. And what we don't know is we don't know that down that river, because right now the waters are peaceful and it looks fine, and, and, and what we don't know is that just a little bit down the river, there's rapids, there's rocks, there's waterfalls where it's going to test the security of this little boat that we call our own way. And it's not that God forces us to go. It's that we have chosen a different way. We've chosen to serve somebody else. Now, why would God do that if he loves us? He absolutely does. He loves us so much that he will not force anyone to follow him. And so when we choose to reject God, whether completely or partially, God takes his hand off and he allows us to follow the course and reap the consequences. All of us have experienced this. And even those of us that have, that, that have served God, have you ever done something that you knew the Bible said was wrong and you reap the consequences of it even though you're a Christian? We've been there. Now imagine the severity of it if you were somebody that did not have that relationship with God, did not have that hope of repentance, did not have the, that, that connection to grace. And then God says, here are the consequences. Because when we reject God, what Paul is talking about in these verses, Romans 1, 24 through 27, is he's saying when we reject God, we are only left with our desires and appetites and nothing to help manage them. One pastor said it this way, when man rejects God, he becomes an animal. There are just drives that we have. There are things that God put inside of us that are, that, that are good desires, and yet without God to govern them and God to guide them, we will pursue all kinds of things, trying to fulfill those desires with illegitimate things. When the God of the universe says, I am all that you need. And this is what we see in Romans chapter 1, 24 through 27. People fell into sexual impurity when they rejected God. Now, what we have to understand is that sexual impurity covers a lot of ground. 
The New Testament, sometimes we look at this passage and we look at verses 25, 26, and 27, and we go, well, that's what Paul's talking about. That's the, that's the issue. But sexual impurity covers a lot of ground. The biblical definition of sexual impurity in the New Testament and the Old Testament is anything, remember that, anything sexual that happens outside of the marriage between a man and a woman. Anything. That includes our thought life. That includes our entertainment. That includes anything sexual outside of marriage. It includes the actual act of sex outside of marriage, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. It is included in it all. And in Romans chapter 1, 25 through 27, Paul is giving specific example of a general statement from verse 24. Verse 24 is kind of like the big topic. Uh, man fell into, human beings fell into sexual impurity. This is what happened. And he said, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you a specific example of what happened. And in verses 25, 26, and 27, it talks about how man and women, women rejected the natural desires that God gave them and gave themselves over to relationships that shouldn't happen. Now, homosexuality is not something that would have been foreign or even unusual to Roman Christians. In fact, it was celebrated in the Roman Empire. History records that only one Roman emperor out of the first 15 did not practice homosexuality. And the one that didn't, he was considered odd. Here's what we need to know. Just because culture says it's permissible does not mean that it is not sin. Paul is commenting, he's commenting on a well-known issue in his day. It's not something that was like an obscure reference that we would understand later on. The people that he was writing to would have known what was happening. And what he's saying is he's saying is that homosexuality is a rejection of the natural order of how God created humanity. This statement applies to many things. There are many things that are the result of a rejection of God in our lives. We can make a list this morning of, of trying to fulfill the desires that God gave us outside of the realm of his authority. But just because culture says that it's permissible, anything, just because culture says it's permissible, does not mean that it is not sin. And Israel was warned of this. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. Uh, Isaiah, or Israel was facing judgment from God because of the things that they had gotten involved in as a nation. And, and Isaiah came to them and he said this. He said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those, and how, this next line is us, our society to a T who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Because you see, if we don't have God governing our thought process and in governing our, our society and our civilizations, we begin to create our own. We begin to create our own morality. We begin to create our own wisdom, if you will, to where we begin to say certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And it may or may not line up with what God says. But what we do as followers of Jesus is we do not listen to culture. We listen to the truth of God. And so Paul continues in Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 28 through 31. He says this, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. How many feel encouraged this morning? I just feel like I can walk out and it's been a great day at church and God is just awesome. And, but what Paul does here is he links the two passages together. That little word that starts the beginning of verse 28 says, furthermore. And what he's saying is he's saying all of those things that I just talked about in Romans chapter 1, 24 through 27, I'm not done. And sometimes what we can do is we can use it as an indictment 
we can use this passage as an indictment for homosexuality. But it's about so much more. And if we do that, if we read these verses and we only see, well, that's those people, that's that section of society, that's those people that have rejected God, then what can happen is we can completely miss how it applies to all of humanity. Paul's purpose in writing Romans 1.18 through 32 is to show that all human beings are without excuse before a holy God. All human beings need a Savior. Now, I want you to see this morning, it doesn't negate the fact that what we just talked about is true. If I were to walk through the crowd this morning and I would have some people stand up, uh, and I don't want to embarrass anybody this morning, so I'm not going to have you stand up, but if I were to begin to describe the things that people are wearing, the things that I know about them, and I would be just begin to make a list, and if I was going to write it down, and I would write the truth about every single person, how many of you know if I would write something about Doris and I would write something about Shauna and then I would write something about Matthew and then I would write something uh, about Kevin, that what would happen is when I got to Kevin, the things that I said about Shauna weren't all of a sudden not true, right? And so when we look at this passage, we have to understand that the things we just talked about are absolutely true. Romans 1, 25 through 27 tells us that homosexuality <laughs> is a rejection of the natural order of God, but it is a one part of a larger section of scripture that says that all human beings need a savior. Now let's look at this passage again, the last part of it, and let's see how we typically read this passage. It's gonna come up on the screen and I'm gonna read it with you. It says, because of this, it's a lot, I know it's gonna be okay. Uh, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandon natural relations with women and inflamed with lust with, for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, and depravity. They are full of murder, strife. They are God-haters. They have no understanding." And what we typically do is we go, that's the world without God. I'm not a murderer. I don't hate God. I'm not involved in homosexuality. And so this passage doesn't apply to me. There are people out there that are outside of the church and they have no understanding of God. And this is who Paul is talking about. But let's look at this one more time. And let's look at the, ver the words that maybe we would tend to skip. Let's read it one more time. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. That includes us. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you are willing to do anything to get it? And depravity. They are full of envy. Have you ever looked at what somebody else had and said, I wish that I had that? I, I wish that I had the house that they had, the job that they had, the spouse that they had. I wish that I had the things that they had. Murder, strife. Is there any discord in any relationships this morning? And maybe that discord is fueled by selfish desire. Maybe it's a difference of opinion and you know that maybe in your heart you know that you're wrong, but you just want your way and so you're just going to continue to dig in your heels. And there's strife. Deceit. We've all been there. I've been there. Have you ever made a comment to make yourself look better than you actually are? Have, and I've been there. Or here's the other side of it. Have you ever withheld the truth because the truth would make you look less than you actually, than what you want people to think that you are? Deceit, malice. Have you ever had ill will towards somebody? Have you ever wished that maybe somebody, based on what they did or what they said or who they are, that you wished that something bad would happen to them? And I'll tell you right now that we're there as Christians. 
sometimes the things that we put out on social media are not full of grace. They may be truthful, but they are not full of grace. And sometimes they are even full of malice to say, I hope God will judge them. But what we need to know as Christians is that the judgment of God is not for us to deal out. The judgment of God comes at the end of this life. And what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to pray and believe that God would reach those people. And we are supposed to pray and believe that God wants to use us to do it. That's our job. And so if we have ill will that we completely, here's what we do as Christians and we call it spiritual. We write people, even people groups off and say they're just lost. We're all in this. They're gossips. Have you ever talked about somebody else that wasn't there? Uh, when uh, Donald Miller, our district superintendent, was here a few months ago, one of the things he said is he said, gossip is talking to anybody about somebody else that they can do nothing about. And we've been there. Slanderers. Have you ever said something, have I ever said something that would in intentionally incriminate the character of somebody else? Even if I meant the best possible motive, have I ever said something that would tear down somebody else's character in the eyes of another person? That's slander. God haters, we don't, we don't, we don't hate God. But do you know that in the Bible when it talks, uses the word hate, what it's saying is it's saying, it, what it means is love less. And do we ever have anything in our lives that we love less than, or that we love God less than we love that thing? If, it, if so, then there are instances where we suppress the truth and we are. God haters. Insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. We're good at this. We're really good at this one. Hey, anybody know what this is? This, this is technology that we have learned to create ways of doing evil. Uh, and here's just a few examples. Have you ever looked up something on your phone that you then went and deleted the history so nobody would know? That wasn't a possibility 100 years ago. But it is today. And we've become, we've figured out how to do it. We all carry it on our own, and everybody has their own, and so we don't share, and so nobody can know necessarily what's going on there. And we do this little thing called a passcode for security, but really it's just to keep people out because we don't want them to know what we're doing. We invent ways of doing evil. And it seems like with technology, we just continue to grow in that. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, and these last three are kind of like if you miss the rest of this, these last three will get you sometimes because sometimes even in our spiritual piety, I'll say it that way, we can even be people who don't show love because somebody disagrees with us or somebody hurt us or somebody is, believes differently than we do, and so what we do is we write them off. Have you ever kept somebody at arm's distance specifically because... You wanted to, not because God told you to. No love. Can you begin to see how this is nearly all inclusive? You look at this list and you go, it's not just this person, it's not this, this person, not this person I don't like. It's all of us. And if for some reason you somehow, you're more spiritual than the rest of us and this missed you, this is just one of what the New Testament calls a vice list. And there are many vice lists throughout the New Testament with many other things that aren't included in this list. And what it is, is it's just a picture that we're all guilty. We all need a Savior. And what we do is we sin because we reject the truth of God as being for us. And when we reject the truth of God, we do not live under the authority of God. Often what we do when we reject the truth of God is we create a God in our own image. It's amazing how much when somebody creates a God that's outside of the God of the Bible, they tend to agree with everything they want to do. Or they tend to be okay with certain things being allowed in their lives. Uh, Timothy Keller, he's a pastor in New York, he said it this way. He said, if your God never disagrees with you, you're probably worshiping something other than the God of the Bible. Because there are times that truth will be offensive. Truth will hurt because God has commanded some things that we're not there yet. We aren't 100% on board with what God wants to do. 
But my prayer this morning is that in the presentation of the truth of God from Romans chapter 1 is that you hear the truth. And if the, one, of the, one of the things I was telling Pastor Brandon and a couple of other people that I brought in kind of on the writing of this message is I said, I want to be able to speak the truth. And if the truth offends, I can't do anything about that. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to speak it in such a way that the way that I presented it was offensive. And so we look at this truth about us that we are all there. And what we do is we reject the truth of God because if there is a God, then there's a corresponding morality for how he wants me to live my life. And sometimes the first step for people beginning to approve a lifestyle that they know they shouldn't live or be involved in things, whether it be entertainment, whether it be anything that we can get involved in, anything from that list, is go, well, my God's okay with that or God doesn't exist at all. But remember Romans chapter 29, verse 18, that says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. When there is no God, anything goes. And there may be those places in our own lives where we are doing things, we're allowing things in our lives, and it may be in that place of our lives that we have rejected the truth of God. Romans chapter 132 says this, Although they knew no God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. The question for us this morning is, what do I promote by my life. We can also, we, and know this, we can also give permission by our silence. Things that we don't say anything about, things that we, we, we don't uh, give an opinion of. Now there's a difference between giving your opinion, speaking the truth, and being abrasive. Jesus was full of truth, but he was also full of grace. And there are certain things living, remember, Jesus lived during the time of the Roman Empire. There are certain things that Jesus could have actively spoke out against, but for some reason he chose not to. Because he chose to focus on certain things. He chose to focus on the things that matter most. And what we do as Christians is we have an incredible capacity for self-deception. And what we do is we take uh, passages like Romans chapter 1 and we say, well, that's for somebody else. And we begin to justify maybe some very things that are in that list and say it's okay. And sometimes we do it in community and we go, well, these people over here feel like it's okay and these people over here feel like it's okay and they're all Christians and so it must be okay. But have you ever considered that maybe that group of your friends that is giving you permission to do things that in your heart you kind of know that you're not supposed to do, could it be that that same very group of friends is suppressing the truth of God at some point in their life? What we are called to do is we are not called to decide our morality based on what our community does. We are called to decide our morality based on what the Word of God says. And if, we, if our morality runs against what the Word of God says, then I am the one that has to adjust. We don't adjust the truth of God. We're responsible for what God's revealed in His Word. We live in America, we live in a society where almost everybody has a Bible and some of us have more than one. And so it's not that we don't have access to the truth of God. Paul said it this way, he said, live up to the light that you've already received. We got a whole lot of light that's available to us. And if I have peace in my own life, if there is any area of my life that I have peace about sin, then at some point in my life I have suppressed the truth of God. And I am somewhere on what I call the downward spiral. And if I don't make things right with God, if I don't come back to God and and allow him to have the supreme ownership over my life, then I am just as guilty as anybody else. Because the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter if you're at what we would consider the bottom of the downward spiral or if you're at the top or you're somewhere in the middle. It's being revealed against all unrighteousness. And now what I want you to hear me this morning, the correct response to this message is not complacency. There is something that's popped up within the church in the last hundred years that talks about how we make this statement. I'm not perfect. What do we say? Just forgiven. And while that statement is 100% true, I want you to think about the subtle message that that could be when it applies to our lives. What we can say is we can say, well, I'm forgiven and I'm not perfect, so I don't need to change. It's just God is graceful and God is going to be there and God... 
There is something in the New Testament that talks about growing in our faith, becoming mature in our faith, leaving the ways of the old man behind and pursuing the ways of the new life in Christ. And if we forget that part of spiritual formation, have we really accepted the truth of God in our lives? If at some point we are justifying things that we know that God says we should not be a part of, we are suppressing the truth of God. Nor is it an opportunity for finger pointing. It's not look at those people and look at what they're doing and look where they're wrong and God's going to get them and they're going to... No. What this message is for, it's to look in the mirror and with the partnership of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of the Word of God, we say... God, what are my issues? God, what are you doing in my life? Because you know when all of us stand before God, we are not going to be held accountable for somebody else's life. We are going to be held accountable for the revelation that we have received, the truth of God that we have received, and we, God will stand before us and he will look. There, we're, we're working on 201, which is the doctrine of the assemblies of God, and one of the things that it talks about is it talks about the great white throne judgment or the judge, actually the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where believers, the great white throne judgment is where the believers will stand before God and give an account their works will be judged, their life will be judged, and reward will be given based on what survives the fire. So it's not a matter of how can I fix everybody else. It's a matter of, God, what are you doing in my life? And the good thing is that I'm not going to leave you here. I'm not just going to say, we're all going to hell. Go see you later. Have a good day. Um, Romans chapter 116, if you remember this from two weeks ago when Pastor Ashley speak, uh, spoke, it said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to who? Everyone. Everyone who believes. So it doesn't matter if you're at the top of the downward spiral or in the middle or at the bottom. What God says is that the power of the gospel is it brings salvation to you. So I don't know where you stand with God this morning. I don't know where your story is. I don't know if you're a Christian that says, you know what, as I look at this list, there's still some things in my life that God is doing. What I would say to you is that the gospel is the power of God for your life. And here's the truth. And Paul will develop this thinking later on in Romans. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to be done. We are all guilty because one man's sin entered the world and we, began, we, we have been fallen in, in sin ever since and we are all guilty. But just like one man's sin and sin entered the world, through the sacrifice of Christ, through one man's death, the price was paid for every single one of us. And so whether or not you would say, I've got more sin than somebody else, what matters is that the price has already been paid. And what matters is that the power of God for salvation is for you. And if you walk out of this room and you say, God doesn't love me, you have not heard me this morning. Amen. Because the wrath of God is being revealed, but what the wrath of God does is it reveals the extravagance of grace. Because there's not a single one of us in this room that deserves anything that we have. And yet what God says is, I love you and I died for you. And I want you to understand the life that I have for you. And the invitation is yours. The question is, what will you do with it? Stand with me all across this room. Father God, I know that there are those in this place this morning that don't have a relationship with you, God. And I know that we talked about some heavy things this morning. But God, you are the God of incredible grace. And God, I know that there are those in this room that are feeling the weight of it this morning. And God, what you're trying to tell them is you're trying to tell them that they need, is that they need you. You're reaching out to them this morning by your Holy Spirit. The, the heaviness that they're feeling in their heart is not a condemnation. It's not a rejection. It's an invitation. So all across this room this morning, I want to ask this question. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to bow your head. I just want to ask this question. Is there anybody in this room that would say this morning, I don't have a relationship with God? Pastor Andy, some of the things that you 
talked about this morning, they apply directly to me. And I don't have a relationship with God this morning, but I want to know what you're talking about, about the power of God that brings salvation. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you this morning. Is there anybody that says, I don't have a relationship with God this morning, but I, I want to start one. I want to know that I'm forgiven. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to pray, and what I want to invite you to do is if you responded this morning or anything, even what I talk about in just a minute, if you need to pray with somebody this morning, I want to invite you right over here. We've got a door we call it the next room. It enters into another small room where the, some of the pastors will be that we can pray with you specifically about the message this morning about a decision that you made. But one of the things the Bible says is that we need to make Jesus Lord of our lives. And we need to ask him to forgive us of our sins and then we receive the grace that he offers. But I think where this message may apply to more throughout this room is this. Is there anybody in this room that says, you know what, there's some things that we talked about this morning that are in that list. And I would say I'm a follower of Jesus, but I still need help. I still need God's strength. I still need God's grace. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Father God, you see every hand, you see every heart. And what you promise is you promise that if we seek you, we will find you when, you seek, when we seek you with all of our heart. So, Father God, I pray that you would begin to break down the walls that are in our lives. God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would begin to reveal to every single person in this room, God, the thing that you are working on next. God, because every single one of us have some. So God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would reveal that to us and that you would give us the grace to know that it's not a condemnation but an invitation to allow you deeper into our lives. Father God, that we would be people that bleed grace, that bleed your love, that bleed your truth. God, that we would be people that are representatives, that when people see our lives, that it would, it, it would it'd cause their appetite for you to grow because they see who we are. Father God, may we have the hope that your grace promises. Father, I pray for those that are responding to your word this morning. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would confirm that work in them. God, that they would find your life, the life that is truly life. God, that we would be broken from any chains of religion that are on us and that we would be free to follow you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.